1986 was the first time the Mets played an LCS. That was a seven-game series. The Mets opened that series in Houston. Now, Vito, you and I were both not around at that time, but we can still go check out the history books. And the history books say the Mets in that series, they lost game one. And you know how that series ended. I feel pretty confident about this team going into game two. We've seen this team get punched in the mouth. It's been the motto of the whole year. You get punched in the mouth, you come back out the next day, and you answer back. Yeah, and the Mets will send the guy who, look, they've, you know, he, he's kind of just emerged as the ace naturally this season. I don't think that you need to have a quote unquote ace out of spring training. I think that it's an overrated term that people are really over eager to use. But, you know, if there's any one guy you want to put your, uh, your eggs in the basket of in a, in a, I don't want to call it a must win game, but a really nice to have game too. It's Sean Manaya. Hey, what's up? It's Vito Khaleesi. You can find me on Twitter at Vito F. Khaleesi. Jonathan Barron on Twitter at JMB9191. Not the episode we want to be doing after game one, but it's a seven game series. So there's plenty of time to go. We're going into a bullpen game for the Dodgers tomorrow versus who's been our ace for the entire year, Sean Manaya. So the sun does rise tomorrow, John, regardless of what some people on Mets Twitter might be saying right now. Yeah, I mean, first of all, good evening to you and good morning to all the listeners. Uh, not the way that we wanted to wake up or start the series, but, um, you know, we, we haven't had a recap episode like this in quite some time. And obviously, we're fortunate that's the case. That's why the Mets are playing in the NLCS. Fortunate enough to be going up against the team that Steve Cohen, when he took over the team, said he wants his franchise to be just like he wants to be the East Coast Dodgers. And in game one, we saw why Steve Cohen wants his franchise to, mo to, to be modeled after a franchise like the Los Angeles Dodgers. They virtually did every single thing right in this game one. Jack Flaherty throws seven strong innings. The Dodgers hit with runners in scoring position. They're patient. Um, Gavin Lux puts down a couple of sacrifice bunts, and they both pay off incredibly well. Both those work out for Dave Roberts usually. You see people and hear people saying, stop bunting, it doesn't work. Well, in this game, it does. Um, you know, there's a lot to break down, a lot to unpack here. But I think a really big thing for the Mets in this series, and I do think this is going to be a long series. I did not think that this was going to be a quick series for the Mets or the Dodgers. I see this series going back to Los Angeles for those games, six and possibly even seven. But one thing the Mets are going to have to do if they want to have success is they are going to have to limit guys like Kike Hernandez. No offense to Kike Hernandez. He's a damn good ball player, especially when the month or the calendar flips to October. Gavin Lux and Tommy Edmond. The Mets are going to have to keep the 7, 8, 9 hitters off the base paths of the Dodgers because once the lineup turns over, it's Otani, it's Betts, it's Freeman, it's Teoscar Hernandez, it's Will Smith, it's Max Muncy. This is a tough Dodger lineup. And Vito, this is not a team that's like the Philadelphia Phillies. The Dodgers are bottom 10 in, in swing rate in baseball. Phillies were top 10. Phillies were aggressive. Dodgers are not. The Phillies were a big chase team. The Dodgers are not. The Phillies hit a lot of ground balls. The Dodgers do not. The Dodgers hit a lot of fly balls and line drives. So the Mets are getting a very, very different version of an opponent than they got in the Philadelphia Phillies. And you could say maybe it's the layoff. Maybe it's the time difference. The Mets didn't get to California until Saturday. Or maybe it's the Mets just ran into a bit of a buzzsaw in game one that led to what happened. But it's important to remember, it's one game. As you said, the sun rises on a Tuesday or Monday, excuse me. And the Mets have a chance still to come home with a split to what we all know is going to be a crazy town in Flushing, uh, Flushing Queens on Wednesday night. Yeah, I mean, look, the biggest thing you could hope for when your team is coming back for that game three is a split. We saw it when we went to Philly last week. Obviously, that was the reverse scenario. Mitts win game one, lose game two. Um, tomorrow's a big day for the team, or tonight as you're listening to this. And, um, you know, I wish there were more positives for us to talk about. But kind of like we saw in Milwaukee at the end of the season, which, weird enough, the last time – we haven't had an episode – we haven't had a game this – unfortunate since that Saturday in Milwaukee where they went down early. That was the last time we saw a Mets game where they uh, they kind of gave up a bunch early and it felt a little bit over from the start. And I would say I didn't even feel like that tonight. Um, I've said, I said in a group chat with you and some, and somebody else tonight, like the amount of times that 
the Mets are up 6-0 and I feel tense, you got to feel like that can always go the other way, no matter which side of the game you're watching. Um, but anyway, back to Milwaukee at the end of the season. We saw, we talked about this. Tyrone Taylor was hitting the ball deep, deep to the same spot, deep right field. Tonight we saw Starling Marte go back there twice. We saw Tyrone Taylor go back there. We saw Jose Iglesias early on fly out out there. We're seeing guys connect, just not get that full barrel we want to see to get see the ball go over the wall. Um, and you just got to hope like the tide turned after that game and we saw things start to move in another direction that maybe we can see that tomorrow. And I, I feel pretty confident about this team going into game two. We've seen this team get punched in the mouth. It's been the motto of the whole year. You get punched in the mouth, you come back out the next day, and you answer back. Yeah, and the Mets will send the guy who, look, they've, you know, he he's kind of just – emerged as the ace naturally this season. I don't think that you need to have a quote unquote ace out of spring training. I think that it's an overrated term that people are really over eager to use. But, you know, if there's any one guy you want to put your uh, your eggs in the basket of in a, in a I don't want to call it a must win game, but a really nice to have game too. It's Sean Manaya. You know, you talked about looking for some positives in this game. I mean, look, let's not let's not sugarcoat what happened here in game one. This game got off to about as disastrous a start as you can imagine. You know, Kodai Senga gets Shohei Otani to ground out to start the game, and then he walks three straight guys. And then he kind of catches a break with Mookie Betts going halfway on the Will Smith first pitch fly ball. And then Max Muncy comes up. And Max Muncy's probably one of the worst possible matchups for Kodai Senga because Max Muncy, aside from probably Juan Soto, has one of the best eyes in Major League Baseball, one of the lowest chase rates in Major League Baseball. And this Dodger team, I said this a few minutes ago, they as a team have the third lowest chase rate in baseball. So Kodai Senga looking to get the Dodgers to go fishing on that ghost fork, it just wasn't happening in that first inning. And like Mendy said to Tom Verducci during the, the uh, mid-inning interview that he did, a lot of those ghost forks, a lot of those pitches that were coming out of Kodai's hands, they were never strikes. And he made it easy on the Dodgers to lay off a lot of those pitches and when he did come in with a, a fastball to Max Muncy, Muncy did the good, did his job, deposited into center field. Dodgers take a 2-0 lead. And from there, the Mets' bats go silent in the night. I believe the game just ended. The Mets finished with three hits. So it's the kind of game that you just, you know, the old, the old sports adage is just throw the tape away, right? Burn the tapes. We don't want to watch this. We don't want to see this. The Mets are going to go home. They're going to sleep on it. They're going to show up to the yard tomorrow, as you mentioned. This is a team that has bounced back all year long, and they will do it once again. And that's what we know about this Mets team is they've been in this position enough times to know how to, as Jesse Winker said to us, regulate the emotions. How so many guys in that dugout to this point, having been through so many moments where they could have easily packed it and easily said, oh, well, huh. I mean, you know, if you think a one nothing series deficit in a best of seven, by the way, not a best of five, we are now talking best of seven series. If you think that's tough, how about going down 2 nothing into the top of the ninth inning against the Devin Williams type closer? Because the Mets have overcome that. And what do you think about that crazy game two in Philadelphia coming back and then eventually losing the game and then coming back for game three and game four, winning those two games? The Mets have done that. So the Mets have been there. The Mets have done that. I just think that also, you know, a lot of people, we were watching game five, Dodgers, Padres. A lot of people said, I want this team. I want that team. You know, you might feel a little bit better against one team over the other. But I don't feel like I know a lot of Mets fans felt in, say, 2000 when the Braves and Cardinals played in the other NLDS and the Cardinals won that series and the Mets didn't have to see the Braves again after Atlanta ousted the Mets in 1999. This isn't like that. I mean, this Dodger lineup is deep. And I know the, the Dodgers are going to bullpen on, on a Monday in game two. It's a deep bullpen. You know, the term bullpen game, I feel like it's got a bit of a negative connotation. That's not a throwaway game. The Dodgers are going to throw a lot of relievers that, who, by the way, they didn't throw out there in game one at the Mets and challenge them. And it could be extra challenging because you can't stack your lineup knowing, hey, I'm going to have this pitcher, this starter, and he's going to go out there for five, six innings, and I'm going to go twice through the lineup against him. So a lot to consider, but I'm going to say this, Vito. The Corgi. Is it Corgi or Corgi? What's the proper Cor pronunciation Corgi. on that one? Is it Corgi, Corgi hard G? Cor Corgi. You're not a dog guy, so you, I, I'm, I'm probably asking. I'm not, the wrong not guy. a dog guy. I'm just allergic. That's, I didn't know that. You're allergic to dogs. I'm allergic to dogs, and it sucks because, like, 
I like dogs, but everybody acts like you hate dogs, and it's just like I I can't pet them because my throat closes and my eyes swell up. Well, two questions. First of all, what's the global global percentage of people that are allergic to dogs? Because I feel like that's that's a curse on a person. It sucks. I've said it's worse than peanuts because well, look yeah, like that's worse than peanuts. You can live with that peanut butter. I mean, exactly. My, I, I said to my buddy, I have a buddy who's allergic to peanuts. I'm like, dude, like you don't know how good Reese's are. Like you don't know how good that is. I know how cool dogs are. Like as a kid, don't you think I just wanted to pet dogs all the time? I would hope, but I don't know. I mean, maybe no. And got then to now the point it sucks where you start to resent dogs. Are you now when I have a friend, also? now I have a friend. When I have a friend who has like, I have to like tell friends. I've had a friend be like, "Hey, can I bring my dog over to your place?" And I have to say no because like, if you bring your dog over to my place and it gets all over my couch, then I'm dealing with the residuals of that for the next week. All right. So my my second question was. You said throw clothes up. Now, how bad are we talking? Are we talking like EpiPen have to go to the hospital clothes no, up? Or no, no, it's like a little scratchy. Not scratchy, like a wheeze. Like I just, I have a lot of trouble breathing. Um, you'll hear like a lot of like deep, heavy wheezing, and my eyes will like actually like swell. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know why I just put it together that I've never really heard you talk about any interactions with dogs ever. Yeah, no, I, I like dogs. I'm just allergic. You're allergic to dogs. Well, anyway, I'm yeah. well, I'm asking the guy who's allergic to dogs, whether it's Corgi or Corgi, but regardless of what the actual pronunciation is, I'll say Corgi. I'm pretty sure it's Corgi. And if you guys want to correct me, please do. Um, the Corgi that, you know, shoots the ball into the two laundry baskets, at the bottom of the stairs, viral Twitter sensation. The Corgi foresaw a Dodgers game one victory. And that same Corgi also foresaw Mets in six. So I'm not saying, I'm just saying. And on the Mets in six topic, I was looking because I'm trying to make myself feel better here as we do on Meet at the Apple after a tough loss, Glass Half Full podcast. I was looking at past NLCS appearances in the best of seven era. So when the Mets played the Braves in 69, that was not a seven game series, that was five. When the Mets beat the Reds, that was also a five game series, best of five. 1986 was the first time the Mets played an LCS. That was a seven-game series. The Mets opened that series in Houston. Now, Vito, you and I were both not around at that time, but we can still go check out the history books. And the history books say the Mets in that series, they lost game one. And you know how that series ended. Mets in six. I also am old enough to recall a time where the Mets took game one of an NLCS. That was 2006. I think the anniversary was... uh, Saturday of game one. I was there. Carlos Beltran, big two-run home run against Jeff Weaver. Mets take game one. Mets losing seven. So the point is, game one is very early in a series. I can remember many series in my lifetime as a fan, whether it's of the Mets or the Rangers or other teams that have taken game one in the best of seven series and wound up ripping my heart out, throwing it on the ground, stomping it, running it over with a big tractor trailer and saying, have a nice offseason. So this is not the end-all be-all. The Mets will be just fine. Vito, how am I doing with trying to keep the vibes up? I feel good. Like, dude, you, everything you said made me feel good. But I will say going into this episode, and I will continue this trend I've had the last two weeks. The way I felt after game um, two in Milwaukee versus the way I felt after game two in Philly versus the way I feel today, I have felt better every single time. Game two in Milwaukee, I was... That was a tough. I went home and I was in the worst mood. We were I lying. Was just, we were I was, lying. I, yeah, we no, that was lying. that was a that episode. I was not. I don't. Either of us were not in a good place. Like, we'll move on. And then game game two in Philly. I wasn't lying when I said I felt much better about that week. Like that that game. Like you felt like they put themselves back into it. It's a short series. We were just coming back home. You got that first win. And then today, like you said, it's game one of a seven game series. And I know you look, I know exactly what you said before. I understand that bullpen games are not a cakewalk. And I know this this team specifically has struggled in some bullpen games. But I feel very good about our ace Shamanaya going up against a bullpen game. That's the hope I have. Also, if you just want to talk about what we've said before, when the Mets aren't hitting home runs and you feel like the home runs have to be coming, the Dodgers have just won 33 scoreless innings, correct? Yeah, so if you're going to tell me that they're bound to give up a run eventually, I, I'm on board with that 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 logic. I am. 
that's my point. They're about, there's no way they can keep that up. They're not going to go three more games, not allowing a single run. I highly doubt they go one more game without giving up a single run, especially against this offense who's shown the time they show up most is when things are tough. And look, tonight did not end the way we wanted, but there were moments where they pressed. When Starling Marta hit that fly ball out in what that was the, was that the third or the fourth inning? I think it was, it was the, the third. I think it was the fourth. Yeah, it was one fourth of those inning. two. Anyway, but he hit that ball with two guys on base. And, like, because what we've seen this team come back from, you felt it. Like, you you felt like that could be it. And even towards the end of the game, I, I never – I really didn't give up. So, I I weirdly have so much hope going into tomorrow. And you look back at other baseball – you look back at other series. Look back at Dodgers-Padres. Padres went up 2-1. Look how that series ended up going. You want to look at dire, stri- dire straits. Let's go back to 2004. How do you think Red Sox fans felt after game one? Well, I forget game one. I mean, no, I but think- that's my point. I mean, I understand, but I'm saying, like, after game one, how terrible do you think they felt? Not great. Chilling after game shelled. two, not better. So, no, my Pedro point- got shelled. That was who's your daddy night. That's why don't, I don't ask me John. about game three, 19 8. That was. I used to be I used to watch the Red Sox closely, guys. That's that's why I can <laughs> rattle off all of these, especially back in that era. But no, I, I I hear what you're saying. I mean, you talked about the Padres Dodgers and that connection. Dodgers took game one of that series. Game two, the Dodgers gave up six home runs to the Padres. Now I'm not saying that the Mets are gonna hit six home runs um on Monday, but we've seen this back and forth in virtually all of the playoff series that we've watched to this point, the postseason has been very one team takes game one, the other team takes game two. Outside the wild card round, I don't really think we've had many 2-0 series leads at all. So we've seen this back and forth. And I also, I kind of like, for the Mets' sake, the fact that uh, Sunday night's game started at 8 p.m. And Monday is going to start at 4 p.m. So, and obviously I'm talking Eastern time, but you have a a quick turnaround. You know, you're not going to have a full 24 hours to sit and really think about what went wrong. And I feel like sometimes that's better, especially in, in this sport where, you know, yes, you're game planning, but the Mets know who's going to come out of that that Dodger bullpen in, in one fashion or another. You know, you could probably guess the six or seven guys that Doc Roberts probably wants to turn to on Monday. So the Mets have a game plan, I'm sure, already for those guys. But you just, you know, it's just, it's see ball, hit ball. And I feel like sometimes, especially this time of the year, you kind of have to just go with that. You know, the Mets did square some balls up in this game. Brandon Nimmo had a hard line out to end the first inning. You talked about a couple fly balls that went to the warning track. I mean, look, the ball just doesn't really travel that well sometimes in Los Angeles. Did the Dodgers homer on uh, on Monday? No. Dodgers didn't homer no. on Monday. So, you know, especially as, as it gets later at night, ball just doesn't travel at Dodger Stadium. But luckily, we've seen the Mets be able to win in many ways and not rely on the long ball. And then looking a little bit ahead for this series coming back to New York on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, if necessary, we talked about this with David Peterson last Friday. We talked about this when we also did an interview with Jose Quintana, which you guys will hear pretty soon, I believe. But I might have talked a little cold front into the into the world here because temperatures for games three and four, which will both be 8 p.m. starts, temperatures are going to dip down a little bit low. And I would have to imagine that while the Mets haven't played in cold temperatures in quite a while, they're still a Northeast team. And a lot of these guys are used to playing in some cold temperatures, whereas the Dodgers, they're not used to that whatsoever. So perhaps that'll be a little advantage the Mets will have and their pitchers will have. When you see your breath and we're playing baseball, you know that things are good. And we might have that that situation um, this week at City Field. So I look forward to that. Like I said, this is a long series. This is the kind of series that if the Mets are going to triumph, if they're going to win the pennant here, and that's what we are fighting for, think about that. We're trying to win the National League pennant here. Not the division series, the pennant. This is big boy baseball against a really, really good Los Angeles Dodgers team. The Mets are going to win the pennant. This is going to be a dogfight, no pun intended. I know that's kind of become a bit of a pseudo theme here in this episode, Vito. This is going to be a dogfight. This is going to be a series that's not going to be over in five games. This is going to be a six or seven game series. And we just have to remember that this is just the first of the many blows 
and the many twists and the many turns that we are going to see between now and the final 27th out. And I didn't mess it up this time because I know I messed it up with David Peterson. 27th out of the final game of this series. We're just getting started. So as Vito likes to say, hold on to your butts. Hold on. Your, do you know what movie that's from? Hold on. Hold on. It's Jurassic Park. Yes, it is from Jurassic Park. Nice. You didn't think I was going to get that. I didn't, and I was hoping you would because me and Brendan and other people have said to you it's from Jurassic Park a bunch. So I was I've never seen stuck. Jurassic Park. I just I've I've heard that, and I just know it's from there. What's the most famous line from Back to the Future? Great Scott. Uh, not that one. That doesn't count. Uh, it's your kids, Marty. Yeah, I don't know that one. Yeah, I mean, back to the few, back to the few, great Scott. Uh, I can tell you the most famous line from Fever Pitch. What is it? Can I guess what it is for you? I have a couple, but yeah. Is it Lobster Fingers? That's one of them for sure. Be okay. <laughs> because there was a thing in my, like, my dad would tape games and he wouldn't want to know the score. So, like, that was a very relatable thing. So, yes, that was one of them. They Need Me? That's a good one. But no, I think I think the one I'm thinking is a very underrated one. Wait, is it? I like. I was gonna. Get, I love you, and I was gonna give up my seats. Okay. No, it's when she runs on the field, and he goes, "How's the grass? Is it spongy?" <laughs> or, well, or the guy that has the sponge. Here, kid, have a sponge. That what about too. what about Johnny Damon? That's a good one, also. I mean, that's. Johnny Damon got the sweetest blank in the league. That's I, I still I still say that at games when Johnny Damon's obviously not there. That's a good one. You know, Johnny Damon, he made a uh, he made a he made a big mistake. He would have really just been a legend forever. I know he kind of is one in Boston, but I'm surprised he, just, he didn't throw out a first pitch tonight. Well, I don't know. I mean, that was pretty look, that was pretty cool. Manny, Manny's awesome. Yeah, you, you Manny know, I is love awesome. Manny. It's just I love Manny Ramirez. And it was cool seeing him and David Ortiz like the World Series. They got knocked out by the Phillies in I think six. But like it's just Manny Ramirez. You think Red Sox? It's just I understand Manny Wood was sick. Like I love Manny Ramirez. Any chance to see him? But like you're the Dodgers. You have tons of people you can bring back for that first pitch what that are like. Backs? What about Oral Horschizer? Oral Horschizer could have thrown out the first pitch, and that would have been a shot at the Mets because Oral Horschizer was a Met at one point. I think I saw Nomar is going to be throwing out a first pitch. I know Nomar does the pre and post on Spectrum, which... John, I, mean, I thought you were joking. I thought you were making a Red Sox joke no, when you said I'm that. No, I'm serious. Nomar, Nomar's like fully emaciated himself as or ingratiated, whatever the word is. He He's become a Dodger. He is like, has, he's totally erased his Boston Red Sox history and he's all in with the LA Dodgers. And I know, I think I also saw Sean Green I don't know if Sean Green is throwing a first pitch with Nomar in game two or a game six first pitch, but I mean, that one's a little bit better. Sean Green had some huge years with the Dodgers. You know, Eric Karros would be a good one. There's a couple others I can think that I'm not going to say, but how about like Andre Ethier or like, you know, James Loney or Russell Martin was a great Dodger for many years. How about Cesar as Turris, you know? You go, you go deep with, you go deep with Dodgers, and you go deep with local radio stations from from the Northeast. I can go deep with any any baseball team from like 2000 to now. So don't worry about. Do you still do so, the grid? Nah, I don't. I don't. It piss, it pisses me off too much. Do you think we've went far too far off track on this episode? We've done. I think we, that we have had the perfect amount of off track here. We don't go off track that much anymore, so I think it's fine. And, like, honestly, after a game like this, just, like, talk to your friends and, like, enjoy yourself because, like, it was a tough game, but tomorrow's going to be a new day. And you know what? The Mets don't play that well when they have a few days off. We've seen that in the past. Like you said, they're getting right back into things tomorrow. Quick turnaround. You get to have that goldfish mentality, and you get to run out there, and you get to punch back. And I, there's no team I would rather watch punch back than this team. I feel very good, man. I love watching this team play, and it's not over yet. No matter what, this team is playing more games. Today was tough. Fans, we just got to get over it, move on to the next day. It's going to be a beautiful Monday afternoon. Think about it. It's Monday. It's cold out. It's getting dark out earlier. You're getting out of work. Maybe you slip out of work a little early. 
Maybe run it just like don't go to work tomorrow or today. Not a bad Say idea. It again? Maybe you just don't go to work at all. Maybe just don't go to work at all. But even if you do, 4.30, maybe sneak out, get home. You're going to watch the Mets play from 5 to 8, and then you're going to no, no, have no. a the game whole night ahead. Four. The game starts at 4. <laughs> do not expect the game to be starting at 5. I thought it was at 5. No, it's 4 o'clock. Yankees at 7.30. Rangers, Red Wings at 7. Jets, who cares about them? Yeah, not to go off topic again, but I just saw the Super Bowl logo for the first time. Uh huh. And you know, like you know the yeah, thing about know, it, like I know the thing. I know the thing. They did that on purpose. They 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 were thinking something was going to happen that's very obviously not happening. Yeah, no, it's not happening. Uh, one more thing I want to mention from this game one. If we are trying to draw positives, didn't really have a great result, but Jeff McNeil just being in the batter's box, and I mean. He, he did the Jeff McNeil thing. He swung at the first pitch. I thought he was going to loop that one to center field. Yeah. Instead, uh, the shortstop camped under it there. But it was great to see Jeff come up in that situation. I'm sure he was excited. Uh, you know, when Jeff broke the wrist back on, I think he was hit by the pitch on September 6th, that Friday night game against the Reds. It felt like he was done for the season. That was the terminology that was used at the time when the news broke the following Saturday. So for Jeff to be back at this point in time, of course, he made the roster. Um, just, you know, cool to see that he's worked his way back and really that the Mets stayed alive long enough for Jeff to come back. And we knew at the time it was probably going to take the Mets getting to the, at least the LCS for Jeff to be able to come back. So that's just a testament to the job that the Mets have done to still be playing baseball for Jeff McNeil to come back and for him to get that plate appearance. Awesome to see. And you know what? I'm sure Jeff McNeil will make a, dif a, di a difference and an impact because a lot of the different Mets, we said this to David Peterson that have taken a plate appearance. I think he's the 13th to take a plate appearance in this postseason. Nine of them have driven at least driven in at least one run. And I'm sure at one point or another, Jeff's going to come through with a big hit as well. So just wanted to throw that out there. Do that. Yeah, man, it, it would have been a shame if we didn't bring up Jeff McNeil, especially because if you remember that first time he spoke to the media after he got hurt um, and he was asked if he thought he would be able to come back this year, he said, I, well, if the Mets make a deep run into the postseason, I think you'll see me again. And he predicted it. The Mets made a deep run into the postseason. You saw him back in there yesterday. And like you said, I thought he was going to do the Jeff McNeil thing and golf one right into right behind the infield. Um, but look, we've said this a bunch tonight. Today, you're listening to this. It's a new day. You only got to wait till four o'clock, not five o'clock, four o'clock to watch the Mets play. And that means the game's going to be done even an hour earlier. So you're going to be having more of your night after. And then. Wednesday, you might get to come to City Field and watch the Mets play baseball there in person, see the on-field ceremonies, and finally, we get to see a night game at City Field. And John, I want to ask the Mets fans coming on Wednesday, I want to start, I kind of want to try to start a movement for what fans should wear to the games on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and that's orange. We obviously share Dodger blue with the Dodgers. I would love to see Mets fans make a point to wear as much orange as they possibly can because I don't want Dodgers fans watching this TV and getting comfortable thinking it's a sea of blue. I think a whiteout would go hard. We don't have as much white merch, man. I mean, then you're talking about a whole new thing. Also, the Dodgers wear white. The yeah, Dodgers I don't mean, wear orange. I guess you're right. That is the caller that derived from the Giants, who were longtime rivals of the Dodgers. No, it's a good call. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's very fair call. So you guys heard Vito. Get that orange out. Rock the orange. I say orange. Orange. I know that some people are critical of the way I say orange, but really, really as opposed to what? Um, I'm told it's orange. So I, I don't know. I don't. I think those people got to got to chill and find other things to be upset about. How do you say? How do you say, Larry Bird? Larry Bird. Yeah, I say Larry. So I guess I just, I just, I guess I have an aggressive, like, I don't know. I don't know what kind of an accent it is, though. I don't just really think I have an accent. Northeast. Just Northeast, man. I say Tommy sometimes instead of Tom. Like, Tom, Tommy, Tommy is weird for me to say. Tommy is weird for me to say. So I'll say Tommy sometimes. Tommy. Sounds like I you're the one who was watching the 04 Red Sox closely, not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think. We should wrap this one up. This I told this you this was going to be 10 minutes. I told you. I, I had a feeling you were going to try to. Push. 
This you guy's gonna, like it's gonna be ten minutes. We have nothing. You to were talk gonna about. no, but I knew you, you pushed this one further along because you wanted you it to this be one further along. No, I was not sandbagging. No, 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 no. All natural. All, All natural. Right. Look, guys, we'll be back here to tomorrow after game 30 two. Minutes, though, exactly. So I got fifteen more seconds to be annoying. <laughs> we'll see you guys back here tomorrow night. Uh, thank you for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at Vito F. Khaleesi, John at JMB9191. Go check out our interviews with David Peterson and Jesse Winker. Also, on the off day or the day after, I'm not sure which one yet. Probably after, probably the day of, probably Wednesday, our Jose Quintana interview will drop because we won't have an episode to recap the night before. So Wednesday, we'll be dropping an interview we did with Jose Quintana, so keep an eye out for that. But, um, yeah, lots of good stuff coming out. A lot more baseball to watch. These Mets are going to come back hot tomorrow. Thank you, guys, and we'll meet you back here at the Apple tomorrow night. Keep the faith. Mets in six.